Well, hello there. I'm Kate Bowler, and this is Everything Happens. This is a podcast about those times in life where everything is swimming along, and then suddenly you're drowning. The divorce, the pink slip, the diagnosis. This is about befores and afters, and how sometimes before was better. Today, we're going to talk about caregivers, the people whose hearts are broken when your life falls apart. The people who are helping you pack boxes after your husband leaves you or pitch in with childcare or count out the medication because you can't do it on your own. This is about the village. When I got sick, it took me a while to realize that I wasn't alone in this. There were so many people around me who were carrying me, and frankly, sometimes they got tired. Everyone can get to the point where there is nothing left. They are giving and giving and giving, and they can actually run out. And I'm not sure I noticed that before. Today, I want to introduce you to Mark Lukacs. During his freshman year of college, Mark met Julia, a gorgeous, successful Italian woman, and they fell in love. At 24, they were married and moved to California to start their lives together. Julia would continue to climb the corporate ladder. Mark would teach. And everything was going according to plan. But then mental illness gripped their lives and turned their plans upside down. Mark tells their story in a gorgeous memoir called My Lovely Wife in the Psych Ward. Mark, I am so excited to be talking with you today. Kate, thanks so much for that intro. It's great to be talking to you, too. Well, I i mean, at the beginning of your book, you just fall in love with your love. And I think <laughs> part of the amazing thing is realizing our lives are just made up of these tiny, boring, totally amazing details. And you fell in love with all the details of Julia. So what drew you to her when you first met? Well, I would say at the core, it was her smile. Mm-hmm. That Julia has, you know, back on... Um, instant messenger days yeah. julia's im name was like g smile because it was like <laughs> her name is spelled with a g because she's italian and the first thing you see and the last thing you forget mm. is this gigantic radiant smile and um i actually heard about her first yeah because i was unpacking my dorm room i had literally been at college for an hour <laughs> and this, And this guy on my hall comes running in. We start chatting. And he's like, apparently there's this gorgeous Italian girl who's in our grade. And I was like, oh. (laughs) And it kind of started already there for me. (laughs) It was like I I was the fish. There was the hook. And I went for it. (laughs) That's so uh, awesome. um, And I love the fact that you refer to it as grades. Like that's how you know how old you were. You were like 12 years old and you were already Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And so – we um we met a few days, like maybe day two of uh, the orientation stuff, mm. and I was super intimidated. She was, in fact, very, very beautiful and had this radiant smile. And um, my my sort of way of dealing with being intimidated by her was to not actually talk to her. <laughs> instead, smooth. yeah, yeah, right. Good, good call. <laughs> so instead, I yelled at her. Where um, there was this movie out called Life Is Beautiful, which is an Italian movie. And the protagonist, he says, uh, buongiorno principessa, which means good morning, princess. He mm. he sort of yells that out at really inappropriate times to this woman he's falling in love with. So I was like, I'm going to do the exact same thing with this Italian girl. So like I'd see her <laughs> across the quad going to class at 9 a.m. And I'd yell out, buongiorno principessa. And it always got a smile. It always got a little chuckle, which was good. Um and it meant I didn't actually have to have the courage to really have a conversation. Yeah, with yeah, yeah, yeah. Her. Yeah. Right? And, and then and one day she's like, I think I'm in love with the guy that yells at me all the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, what happened is we met at a party and we actually started talking. <laughs> uh, this was like three weeks into being at college. And it was from that moment on, I think we were Mark and Julia. Hmm. And yeah. then you got married pretty quick. I mean, after college and had this really beautiful life. You had surfing right down the road and this cute little bulldog named Goose and she got her dream job and everything seemed perfect until it wasn't. Do you mind telling me what happened? Sure. So we moved to California literally the day after we got married. We Mm -hmm. knew nobody in in San Francisco. 
we created this happily ever life together. And um, Julia, who is, as you said, she's like super, super successful, very ambitious. And so she got this job and it was at a very cool company where she really, I think, wanted to fit in. It was during the summer, so I was off because I'm a teacher. So I was home when she came home from work. And it was literally on that first day that I noticed an insecurity Mm -hmm. and a lack of confidence that I had never seen in Julia up to that point. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, we're young at this point. We're only 27, but we still had known each other nine years. For sure. So it was was pretty striking to see. You know, it was like she she wasn't really clear if she was going to fit in. She was kind of intimidated by how smart everyone was and how kind of hip this whole vibe was. And, you know, I just kind of tried to encourage her and remind her of how successful and smart she is. But that seed of insecurity very, very quickly grew and spiraled out of control. Mm -hmm. And it kind of manifested itself in different ways. I mean, the first thing I think was just her feeling stuck at work. Like she'd just get like a really simple task and wouldn't know how to go about it and would sit there and stare at a computer. And then she might call me or email me for help. Um, And then at home, she kind of lost her appetite and wouldn't really eat dinner. We'd sit down and she'd kind of poke at it but not really eat much. And then she started to lose the ability to sleep at night. And that was when things really got hard because, um, you know, I felt like I could help her. Like she would send me emails and I would proofread them and send them back to her. Like I could help with that. Yeah, I could like cook for her and try to encourage her to eat. But it's really hard to stay awake with someone and try to get them to go to sleep. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, it really kind of exploded when she started to have delusions. And she, in the nights awake, would say she was having conversations with God or having conversations with the devil. Yeah. And that's when I got really, really scared and ended up taking her to the emergency room. What was that moment like for you? You know, we, we took her to the hospital and my expectation of how mental health works was that they were going to basically give her a pill, send her home, and maybe a day or two later she'd be sleeping and she'd be fine. And instead, they were like, we don't really know what's going on. We know what symptoms she has. She's acting psychotic. I didn't even know what that word was at the time. Yeah. But basically it meant like extreme paranoia, hallucinations, um, agitated, racing thoughts. So they admitted her to a psychiatric hospital, and and that was where I really I felt like our life flipped upside down. Oh, and I mean, in the process it took to actually get her into a mental health facility, it sounds like it absolutely broke your heart. It was really yeah. callous, and then it took weeks to get a diagnosis. I, yeah. You write, with one word, I lost my wife and gained a lifelong patient. And I think that's something that a lot of caregivers can really relate to. Well, you know, I felt so central to what was happening to Julia because I was married to her and I knew her really well. Yeah. And I I felt like the doctors and the nurses, they did not see me as central. They thought, we're going to deal with the woman who's sick. Okay, this is her husband who loves her, but he should just be in the waiting room and we'll give him an update when we have one, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. I just felt so helpless. I was, like, offering every detail I could to anyone who would listen. But it was always kind of this, like, well, let's wrap it up. We kind of got to go deal with your wife here, you know? Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, how can you help her mental state if you don't know who she is? And I'm trying to help you understand who she is. Yeah. And I was really impatient for a label for it because my thought was once we can label what she has – then we can know how to fix what she has. Yeah. And and the first label they gave was a really scary one. They they thought she had schizophrenia. And that was where I felt like, oh my God, here I am, 27. I've been married for three years. Yeah. And I guess this means that for the rest of our life, Julia's gonna go through stuff like this. Yeah. Cause then you don't just have like a trauma. You have to learn a whole new language, yeah. a whole new series of categories and ways of framing yep. life. Yep. Now I should say though that they subsequently changed her diagnosis two times as her illness continued to unfold. And she did face future hospitalizations. Julie's been in the hospital three times. Yeah. Um, 
But the diagnosis that they have now and the one that has led to the medication treatment that seems to be working for her is that she has bipolar disorder, you know, and that is generally means a lifelong condition with highs and lows. And for Julia's highs, a lot of people who have bipolar, they experience like mania as something that's really fun where you feel super creative and you're really outgoing and you want to party and like spend lots of money. But Julia's mania feels psychotic. So it's actually really scary and unfun. Yeah. And then once that resolves, she ends up facing a really, really deep and dark depression. I was um, I was recently watching the movie The Big Sick. Have you seen that? Oh, what a great movie. What a great movie. Hello. No, please sit. Please sit. I'm Dr. Cunningham. Emily's attending. I'll be coordinating all the doctors and orchestrating your treatment strategy. All the doctors? How many are there? Five. Five? Why so many? I mean, is that that normal? Yes. It's standard for patients in the ICU. We come at it from many angles. We confer. We immediately initiated our tracheal intubation. Thankfully, it hasn't affected her heart at this point. We don't know the exact nature of the infection yet. But we got on our broad Lines spectrum of antibiotics. Critical infections centering around the costodiaphragm. Our theory process. is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus that's aureus. Hold on. Yeah. That's a P. That's an F or a PH? P- P- PH. No, it's death. That was very reassuring, wasn't it? When I watched it, I watched it by myself, and I was I was seeing it from the patient perspective, like the main character, right. and she's, right. you know, um, has this whole unfolding medical situation. But I watched it with my husband, and he's not a super emotional guy, and I just saw him absolutely tear up, and I realized he was watching it from the 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 caregiving perspective of the person exactly. who's listening to all that disorienting language. And just trying to figure out like which way is up. I that was a, I mean when I read your book, you just get this sense of the overwhelming loneliness and disorientation yep. of that period. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I I kind of I mean I think I was it was a product of privilege and upbringing, but I kind of felt like the master of my domain. Yeah, I was living the good life and was in the driver's seat of it, and then all of a sudden it's like boom. My wife was locked away in a hospital. I didn't know what the future held. And I didn't feel like there was anyone I could talk to who could understand me. Retrospectively, in particular, I feel really bad. Like, I know my parents. It was really hard for them. Yeah. They really didn't know how to support me. And then, and then it's interesting because then the network of caregiving, it becomes like a ripple that goes out. So, like, yes. I was the caregiver for Julia, and I was sort of on the front line. But then there was my parents and her parents. And then there was my siblings and then our friends. And then like my parents' friends who might want to support my parents, you know? And so it's this really... Yeah, circles and circles and circles out. Yeah. Exactly. And kind of like the way my thinking has really shifted around illness and especially mental illness is I think we get trapped looking at it as one person experiencing it And we forget those webs and those circles and those networks of people who I think have so much capacity and desire to help and to be part of the solution. But there isn't often the invitation to be part of it. I'm also just aware in talking with you that there are just some situations that are easier to get help with than other situations. I mean, there's a lot of stigma. I. I have a casserole problem. That's how I think about it. Like I have a problem and then people bring me stuff to eat. You get the f- yeah. the food menu <laughs> yes. thing. Like no, the the calendar, right? Everyone puts on their name yeah. on the calendar and signs up. Yeah, yeah. I'm like prime caring bridge material here. <laughs> and <laughs> I was just wondering if it was hard, do you think, to get help for what you really needed? You know, I will say that when I went through this, I often thought of what if Julia had been diagnosed with cancer? How Mm -hmm. would this be different, right? Mm -hmm. And I actually think the hardest part, Kate, was that I lost Julia. Like, I couldn't talk to her about the choices I had to make, what the best treatment was, because she was either delusional or so depressed and so heavily medicated that I could barely get a few words out of her. And so I think... When it's physical, obviously there are emotional and mental components to it, and the person is still mostly intact 
intellectually, sure. mentally, emotionally, then they can be a collaborator through the solution. But I felt like my partner, who I would, of course, gone to otherwise, now I couldn't. So anyone else I turned to, they just weren't my go-to person, you know? Yeah. And so I think that was the hardest part for me. And I imagine it's hard I'm, for you not to feel like, man, I gave up a lot of stuff. Like you yeah. had to give up your job. You had to give up, yep. I think, probably feeling your own age. Like you're probably yeah. 12, you know, and just yeah. like, <laughs> right. and like season of life, you're looking around and everyone's excited about the next concert tickets or whatever. And you're just exactly. like, oh my gosh, when did I get the worst adult problems? And how, yep. how long do I have to carry this? Yeah, exactly. That's, that is such a great description. And I, I think that absolutely added to my sense of resentment. You know, like yeah. I, I went and I saw a therapist throughout all this because I needed to process and she was so helpful and she gave me space to feel that resentment, yeah. that it was okay to feel hurt that life was not easy anymore. Yeah. And it was okay to feel mad about that even. And so rather than like now bury that in layers of shame and guilt because I'm mad at someone who's experiencing something out of her control, my therapist really helped me to be like, it's okay, you feel that. Now let's honor it. And then let's let it go. I've only been the patient. So it's hard. Like right. it took me a while to even realize that loving me was really hard on people. And yeah, I just like I, that made me feel really guilty. Like everyone I touch basically has to go to therapy. <laughs> yeah. And that was what for me, the biggest challenge of all this has been. It was obviously super scary yeah. and really, really isolating. And there was tons of fear and all that stuff. But I think the thing that I had to grow into the most and that Julia had to grow into the most was the challenge of open communication. Well, I mean, there's so many examples that you have of the, of how hard it is to really listen. Like when she's, yeah. you know, describing that she wants to end her own life and I'm sure everything in you just wants to like jump up and fix everything before even letting exactly. her finish a sentence. Exactly. Like I needed to really hear her pain of being psychotic and not trusting her own mind. Yeah. And feeling so depressed she wants to kill herself and end her life. And I needed to hear all those things and not judge her. But then the challenge, Kate, was then after Julia got through her first episode and was feeling better she had to learn that same challenge of listening to me because now it was my turn to feel bad and it was my turn to like put my guard down and really yeah. let myself grieve. And she was like, dude, what's going on? Like, I'm better. Let's have fun. Like, <laughs> we're back to the good old days. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. I just bottled up all of these feelings for almost a year to hide them from you. Now I need to actually let them out. And so it was kind of yeah. her challenge and her turn to have to go through the, the listening. And I think only by actually truly hearing each other do I feel like we can not burn bridges and instead like repair and even make more beautiful bridges with each other. I was really moved by you having a Jonas in your life. You have this little yeah. baby and it then it fills yeah. up your life. And, and like you said, then life falls apart again but at this point Jonas right. is 2 months old when Julia relapses so right. how how did having a son change things that time around after Julia's first episode she was in an outpatient program with her depression for about 9 months and then she just kind of snapped out of it yeah so we we kind of just went back to living and one of the things we really wanted to do was have a child together and so she got pregnant she took up an extended maternity leave. She was actually home for five months. And then when he was five months old, she went back to work and she was only at work for two and a half weeks before she had a relapse of psychosis. It was her second episode at this point. And so I had Julia in the hospital, which felt strangely familiar because we had gone through it. And I yeah. kind of felt like I was dusting off an old outfit that I knew very well and putting it back on to play this role. Hmm. But it was actually one of the doctors who said, um, you have no idea what you're doing because now you can't just focus on Julia. You have to focus on this baby and you have to continue to give this baby everything that he needs while you also 
need to support your psychotic wife knowing that what likely will follow is a suicidal depression, you know? Yeah. And I'll be honest, Kate, like, I, I don't know if there's like an actual line that you cross where you feel suicidal, but I felt pretty darn close where I was like, I just don't think I can do this. Like, I don't think I can yeah. be here for both of these humans who need such different things from me. How the hell do I be a father and a caregiver? And I, I, I just kind of, yeah. I just kind of crawled through it all, you know, barely yeah. making it. I also feel like being a parent saved me in a lot of ways. Yeah. I, yeah. Let me run this by you then. So sure. they don't care about your problems. Not a lot yep. anyway, just a yep. little enough yep. to know that they're going to yep. get the juice box. They, their, their time has a weird quality to it. Like it's kind of yep. unspooling. Like, and then it's yep. just a puddle and you get to live in that splashy pond with them called, you know, snack time or exactly. let's go swimming or I, I don't know. I find there's a different kind of mode I get to be in that is not quite the same as managing You know, like, yes, it has caregiving elements to it, but, like, I feel like Zach has helped teach me how to feel alive again. Does that make sense to you? 100%. I 100% agree. I love the joy of parenting, you know? Yeah. Look, it's, it's super hard, and it's exhausting and isolating and all those other things, but, gosh, those moments when, whether you're in a baby phase or toddler or even now Jonas is six and a half and, like, the, the the delight that they bring to life it's like the boost you just feel like you like you're in Mario and you got like a star and you're just <laughs> plowing through everything on turbocharged <laughs> mode because they just make you feel so amazing you yeah. know so that was super interesting because I was going back to kind of like fearful grieving mode for Julia yeah and meanwhile I'm having these just like jaw-droppingly beautiful moments on the beach with our baby learning to crawl and just being like, does life get better than this? At the same time that like, I feel, does life get harder than this? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then sometimes the fragility of everything makes the beauty even more surreal. Yeah. Yeah. You you describe this feeling where the crisis is over, but then the world doesn't go back to the way it was. And I love when you compare it to a tsunami. Can you tell me what that means to you? Sure. It's as if we were on the beach in Thailand on a vacation, and then all of a sudden the wave came through and swept everything away, and we somehow were able to hold on to each other and survive it. But then once the sea recedes, you look around and you realize like things have been demolished and you're going to have to rebuild and you're going to have to in many ways start from the ground up. And I think when we got tsunamied by mental illness, we kind of had no choice but to work to repair our marriage. And so what became at front and center was like, yeah, we were, we were pretty happy together, but now we can't ignore this issue that was really easy to ignore before yeah. because we were generally having so much fun together. Like yeah. when you knock down a house and all of a sudden you're going to rebuild it, you're like, well, we never really liked the bathroom, so let's fix the bathroom. Yeah. So it was the same thing in, in terms of how we had to approach being married. And that was hard, but my God, now I'm 36. We actually have a second child together. It's been four years since Julia's had her third episode. And I feel like by doing all that heavy lifting and doing all that repair work, it really does feel like we're reaping the benefits. And we almost kind of have like a 60 year old marriage rather than a (laughs) mid thirties marriage because we've, we've had to face this stuff. There is this song that you talk about, like it's a motto. So my family growing up had a song that was a motto, but it wasn't nearly as inspirational as yours. There was something about (laughs) pirates and beer. But you talk about how you are true believers. So is it super weird if I ask you if you wouldn't mind singing that for me? So when I was in high school, I got into punk, and there's this band called The Bouncing Souls, and I would love to give them a shout out because here I am. 20 years later, still in love with these guys. And they have this song called True Believers. And a tradition that Julie and I started very early in our marriage, we called it dishwasher dance parties, (laughs) where after dinner, we'd crank up music and sort of like as we clean the kitchen, we'd sort of dance our way through it and have a lot of fun. 
And so when we had a baby, we sort of restarted dishwasher dance parties and I danced around the house with him like on the chest, Bjorn. And then like as he became a dancer, he'd do it. So one of our go-to songs was a song called True Believers. And I think the reason it's become so important to me is because Jonas started listening to it when he was like two. And when he was like two and a half, he asked me about it because Mm. he had been listening and he wanted to know what a true believer was. And what did you tell him? I was confronted with like, oh, my God, this is maybe the most important question he's ever asked me at this point. (laughs) You know, like I really need to say it right. And what was so amazing is that I didn't actually have to answer him because he answered and he said, I know what a true believer is, Dad. I'm a true believer. (sighs) And and I was like, yeah, you are. Yeah. And then he's like, you're one, too, Dad. And, you know, this was at a moment where Julia was still in a really fragile place. And so he asked me if Julia, he's like, his mom, a true believer. And it was so important to me that he say yes, not me. I needed him to see her as part of that tribe. Yeah. And so I sort of turned it back and I was like, well, what do you think? Do you think mom's a true believer? And he was like, yeah, she is a true believer. And so like ever since then, that song has held like a hallowed ground <laughs> in my family lore. Yeah. So so here's the caveat, right? I'm not very good at guitar. <laughs> I'm not very good at singing. So that's like where my where my skill set is I here. Love so, it. All right. <laughs> okay. I met some people along the way. Some of them split, some of them stayed. Some of them walk, some walk on by. I got a few friends I'll love till I die. From all these people I try to learn. Some of them shine, some of them burn. Some of them rise, some of them fall. But good or bad, I've known them all. We live our life in our own way Never really listen to what they say The kind of faith that doesn't fade away We are the true believers Whoa, whoa, whoa We are the true believers This is where my bad guitar is like especially (laughs) noticeable I love it And you can ride or you can run Hide under a rock till the war is won Play it safe and don't make a sound But not us, we won't back down True believers all the way You and I We live our life in our own way Never really listen to what they say The kind of faith that doesn't fade away We are the true believers We live our life in our own way Never really listen to what they say The kind of faith that doesn't fade away We are the true believers Whoa Whoa We are the true believers That's what we got. Mark, I love that. When you sing that, all I want is for everyone to find their true believers. It is so beautiful. That's that's what I want too. Mark, it was so great talking to you. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this. The thing that blows me away is how much Mark suffered and how much love endured. Those two realities stood side by side. His love endured not because he felt the same or relied on his naturally insanely happy energy, but he cultivated that love so that it could sustain them all. When someone suffers, everyone around them suffers. Everyone around them hurts and grieves and gets tired at the oars. When I got sick, basically everyone who has ever met me had to form a support group to deal with how awful it was. That felt absolutely terrible, just knowing that I was a burden. But guess what? Love takes up a lot of space, and it can be really heavy at times. So here's to all the caregivers 
who love no matter what. May you get tons of naps and hugs and acknowledgement that your beautiful love is not without a cost. As a care recipient, let me just say it, thank you. Hey, my name is Tobin. I'm married to Kate. I think one of the hardest things for me through this whole situation was living a sort of dual life. On one hand, I had to be supportive and present to Kate and our family in a rough time. And on the other hand, I had to figure out what life might look like should the worst happen. I had to have some sort of road map moving forward for for our son, and I needed to make sure that he was going to be okay. Hi, I'm Karen, Kate's mom. The hardest thing I found was the distance created by trying to protect each other. I knew that she would know how I felt because she was a mother herself, that I would gladly change places with her if I could, so we could only share a reality in tiny doses. Hi, I'm Kate's dad, Jerry. For me, the hardest thing to handle when my dear one was ill was the feeling of pure helplessness. Nothing I could do could make her better. No feelings of anger or unfairness were of any use. I would have taken her place if I could, but I could only watch her pain, exude confidence, and pray. Lots of praying. I'm Chelsea, and Kate and I have been best friends since the late 90s when we went to high school together in our hometown of Winnipeg. I think something that I found really difficult is that there's this kind of weird tension between feeling really close to someone who's in the eye of the storm and also feeling really far away. Uh, So with Kate, uh, we don't live in the same place, and so she was so tired of talking about all things about cancer, which totally makes sense. Of course, she would want a break from that all-consuming reality. So we would connect and we would talk about other things like uh, cosmetic eye creams and um, unexpected plot twists on Canadian reality shows. And so you're talking and engaging and you're in the thick of it, but you're in the thick of it with stuff that sometimes maybe feels really superficial or really separate from the terrible thing that's going on. I'm Carolyn, Kate's friend. One of the worst parts was going with Kate to her first chemotherapy session. I'm naturally fearful, so when at age 35, I was seated in a cancer center with a good friend staring at death, all my worst fears were coming true. I remember being so overwhelmed and scared that I excused myself and called my mom. I needed to cry, but I didn't want to burden Kate. One of the best decisions I made following Kate's diagnosis was to go for counseling to manage my fear. Everything Happens is made because a lot of people decided it mattered. Thank you. Thank you to North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC, Faith and Leadership, an online learning resource, the Issachar Fund, the Lilly Endowment, and Duke Divinity School. And I adore my team, Beverly Abel, Be the Change Revolutions, and Jessica Ritchie. If this is helping you at all, I'd love to hear about it. Please go to Apple Podcasts and post a review, and come find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Katesy Bowler. This is Everything Happens with me, Kate Bowler. <laughs>